also sign the roll sheet. Even if you don't put your email address down, we just need to know that you're here. Um, so welcome to our first Federalist Society event of the semester. My name is Ellen Flint. I'm serving as president for the academic year. The Federalist Society, if you don't already know, exists to promote law and policy. We're a group of conservative and libertarians who are interested in the current legal state. Um, it exists to promote the awareness of the principles that the state exists to protect freedom, that the separation of government powers is central to the Constitution, and that it's the duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. To become a national member, which I would encourage you all to do, is only $5, and it opens up a great network. Um, in fact, today we have Diane Kozub of the local lawyers chapter here with us today. So it's just a great thing to be a part of um, your entire life. And today we have Professor Blackman joining us. He's traveled all the way from South Texas College of Law. Only in Houston, only in Houston, not too far. <laughs> um, so it's state of Texas is pretty big, so we appreciate him being here. He is an associate professor of law at South Texas College of Law, where he specializes in constitutional law, the Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. He's the author of two books, one which will be released at the end of this month, called Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power. Forbes has listed him as a 30 under 30 in law and policy. He's testified multiple times in front of the House Judiciary Committee on the constitutionality of executive action on immigration and healthcare. He's an adjunct, has been an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. His commentary has appeared on the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, numerous impressive publications. Um, you can see all of these on his website, joshblackman.com. And in a bit, we will be joined by Professor Lenny, who many of you know teach tra teaches trademarks here, and he will offer some commentary um, regarding Pro Professor Blackman's speech. So if you'll join me. He is me so impressive, he doesn't even need to be here <laughs> to respond yeah, exactly. to me. <laughs> so if you'll join me in welcoming Professor Blackman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how many of you are one else? Okay, good number of you. Well, I'm glad you're here. The Federal Society uh, is a group that has chapters in every campus law school nationwide. And they bring speakers like myself to give you uh, stuff that you may not learn about otherwise in the classroom. And perhaps best of all, they have Chick-fil-A for free. So I encourage you to uh, meet with Ellen afterwards, sign up, become a 1L rep, you know, uh, get involved in any way that you can. So I have a treat for you all today. Not one constitutional right, but two constitutional rights. We'll be discussing 3D printed guns and the Second Amendment. And this is something that's very cutting, very tech, and very law school, which I'll explain to you in a bit. It begins with 3D printing. Has anyone ever used a 3D printer? Okay, what would you print? Oh, you're smart. <laughs> nice, okay. Oh, a whale, nice. What about you in the back? Yeah. Wow, you guys are productive citizens. What about you? Okay, so all, all of you did things that are, shall I say, socially useful. A whale, a French horn bit, a remote control. None of you made guns. So that means maybe the A&M kids have their heads in the right place. I don't know. But we'll be discussing today the actual creation of guns using a 3D printer. Now, 3D printing works very simply. On a screen, you design an object in three dimensions. The same way you can draw it on a piece of paper, you can draw it on a computer. You can make something as complicated as a house, or a car, or a whale, or a French horn bell. I want to walk you through a very simple formula of how to create. So does everyone remember from high school geometry a cylinder, right? Everyone knows what it is, right? And you may remember that to figure out the volume, or how big a cylinder is, you need to know the radius and the height. So if I say make a cylinder with 20 inch height and five inch radians, uh, radius, math major, what's the volume? There we go. <laughs> Pi r squared times height, right? But if I give you a very simple piece of information using plain English, plain words, you can figure out how big an object is and it actually creates in three dimensions. This is how 3D printing works. You tell the computer, 
create an object of this size and print it out. And you can create a whole host of products like these little plastic trinkets, um, these complicated gears. And it all comes out of this device called a 3D printer. Now, this is a pretty snazzy race car, uh, uh, which you can see being printed out. Um, you can also create pretty lifelike images like this skull cranium. Now, how does a 3D printer operate? Has everyone ever made a candle? How do you make a candle? You take the wick, you dip in the wax, you pull it up. You dip in the wax, you pull, and you keep doing it over and over again, right? Everyone knows what I'm talking about. 3D printing works the exact same way. But instead of dipping something into wax, you spray a very fine layer of plastic. So you see here, there's a little nozzle. And at the tip of the nozzle, there's a little spray. And if you imagine spraying different width of plastic, one on top of the other, you can actually make a shape such as this ball. And here's another image. What happens is it sprays it, gets heated up, and it gets bigger and bigger. So I want to show you an actual creation of an object using a 3D printer. And when you see what's being created, I want you to shout it out. You'll, you'll know in a few seconds what it's going to be, OK? But when you see it, shout out. Let's see, let's see how good the a and kids are, how quickly you get it, because varying schools get it quicker or, or slower than others, OK? So it starts off with you know, this undifferentiated pool of plastic. And then the first layer comes in. It's this sort of honeycomb uh, 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 a lattice, where uh, it's a very strong base to build. So you put a little bit. Put a little bit more plastic, keep putting it more and more. Does anyone see what it is yet? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. A little bit more. Okay, keeps getting bigger, right? One layer on top of the other. Anyone see it yet? What? Frog, okay, you're on the right track. You're on the right track, you're close. Okay, one more. Anyone else see it? One more. Anyone see it? Not going to force it on you. It's a bust, yes, as as your guesses are as well. Um, anyone see it yet? Yoda. Thank you, thank you. From Star Wars, it's Yoda. I gave you a hint. The force. I'm not going to force it on you. Uh, the, the hint didn't take. <laughs> so as you can see, here he comes. Right. You keep putting. Ah, now it is. Right now, now everyone sees it. This is Yoda from Star Wars, and you can create very sophisticated objects simply by layering one layer of plastic on top of another, keeps going, keeps going, and the head is done. This took maybe a few minutes to print. Um, I have no artistic talent. If you asked me to sculpt a Yoda statue, I would not be able to. And I think probably in this room, most people will not be able to. If you give me a piece of clay or whatever, I couldn't do anything with it. But I can click print. And I can design a file on the computer. So 3D printing allows you to create some very impressive objects that you cannot do otherwise. Like, ma'am, could you make a whale out of clay if you wanted to? Abstract, yeah. Could you make your French horn bit? Probably not, right? Yeah. So this technology exists to allow you to manufacture items fairly quickly um, in a very innovative way. Now. People were not content to simply create gears or whales or French horn bits. People said, you know what? God bless America. Let's make some guns. And this is what brings me to today. So I said the story has a very Texas uh, angle to it. And indeed, the first 3D printed gun was created uh, in Texas, not too far from here. I'm in Austin and specifically by a law student at your rival, I suppose, the UT Austin Longhorns, right? He created something called the Liberator, a 3D blueprint of the barrel of the gun. This is Cody Wilson. Cody was a first-year law student, like many of you, at UT Austin Law School. And uh, let's put it this way. He wasn't a good fit for law school. He didn't particularly like rules, uh, which does not make him a very good fit for law, uh, 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 studying 1L. And during his first year of law school, he decided to start putting together 
3D printed gun parts. Um, Cody, I should note, is my client. I'm actually representing him in a case defending his First and Second Amendment rights. I'll get to that case later. So I should note that I'm on the payroll, so to speak. But his case is something that I was drawn to long before I was involved with him. Uh, Cody is an anarchist of the highest degree, and he's a, he's, a, he's a character. He has a new book coming out next month. If you want to learn about him, read, read his book. I think the book is actually called Come and Take It, uh, if you want to <laughs> put another Texas spin on it. So the first thing that Cody developed was this. Does anyone know what this is? God bless Texas. When I give this talk in New York, no any idea what the hell that is. What is this? Like a piece of like a like a like a tray or something? No. This is a, a AR-15 receiver. And to give you a sense, an AR-15 is a type of rifle, and this is the guts. This is what makes the gun actually work. And indeed, this is the actual part of the gun that the government regulates most strictly. The rest of the gun, the stuff that looks scary, that you can buy in any store. This is actually the um, uh, things that makes the gun operate. It's called the receiver. Now, you are allowed to make your own receivers. The government doesn't stop you from doing that. So what Cody did was he made it entirely out of this plastic resin. And you know what? It handled thousands and thousands of rounds. So the most important part of an AR-15, Cody figured out how to print it on a 3D printer. The next item that Cody developed was this little magazine. The magazine, for those who don't know, is the thing that the bullets go into. I, I have to say this because I give talks all over the country. Uh, it's like, when I give this talk at the MYU, I mean, people can make their own guns? Yes, yes. <laughs> he named this magazine, I think it was a 30-round magazine, the Cuomo, after New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, who banned that item. He has a sense of humor. My favorite item that he designed was something called the Dirty Diane. It was a silencer named in honor of Senator Diane Feinstein. <laughs> he has a sense of humor. So Cody made uh, a magazine that was legal in New York and several other states. But this is not what the most, so to speak. What freaked out the US government the most was this. What the heck is this, right? These little twirls and squiggles. Like, what, what on earth is this? This little nail. This is the Liberator. Now, it doesn't look like much like this, right? Like, what are we looking at? These are the parts of a fully functional pistol. This is the handle grip, right? This is the frame. This is the little barrel. The firing pin. These coils make the action to go back and forth and strike the bullet. All of these parts, with the exception of the bullet and the nail, are manufactured using a 3D printer. The, the nail and the bullet are not made at home. And when you put it all together, what do you get? You get this. It's a fully functional pistol. Now, you may see on the floor this piece of rope. Everyone see that? Okay, why is that piece of rope there? Because the first, I don't know, several dozen times Cody tested this gun, as you may imagine, he didn't want to pull the trigger himself. Because that could have blown his hand off. Um, and indeed, many of his first tests, the plastic wasn't strong enough to handle the um, combustion of the round. So he put this little rope on the trigger <laughs> and stood like maybe 15 feet away and like yank. But eventually, he found out how to make the barrel strong enough. He had to treat it with this acetone vinegar bath to make it harden. And I mean, there's some science here, right? This is not, this is not some sort of idiot in his basement doing stuff. He, he had some pretty smart people working with him. And they figured out the right composition, and they made it work. And then, then the gun went viral. Now, Cody put this online in, uh, I guess it was December of, uh, oh, God, it was, I guess, 2012, right? So shortly after the presidential election. Um, not too long after that, the Sandy Hook massacre occurred in uh, uh, Newtown, Connecticut. Here we have Cody putting files and putting videos on YouTube of him shooting this plastic gun that, um, you know, <laughs> looks really scary. And this picture was ill-advised, but uh, <laughs> as his attorney is perhaps not the most advised picture, but you know, when you're dealing with uh, uh, constitutional cases, you're gonna be defending controversial people, okay? People who follow the rules don't go to the Supreme Court. So 
I'm, I actually embrace the fact that Cody has such a, a verve for challenging the status quo, and I think that's one of the reasons why he now has a book called Come and Take It. So this happened shortly after Sandy Hook, and the government freaking, freaked out. Is there anything that Cody did that was illegal? Did Cody break any laws, right? Is there a problem? And this is going to be the bulk of my talk for you today. Printing guns. This is the image that comes to mind, right? You have an inkjet printer, you click print, and a gun spits out. In fact, I've done this event at other schools, and they've called it click to print or click to shoot or something like that, right? Um, as I'll discuss, this is not the case. It's a fairly elaborate process. You have to treat the parts. You have to put chemicals on them. There's many different assemblies. It takes almost an entire week to put these guns together. So it's not the case that you click, print, whatever. But is there anything illegal about making your own guns? Now, how many people in this room have made a zip gun before? Texas? No? Does anyone know what a zip gun is? Shake your head. What? Yeah, the back. Yeah. And what's, what's the most important part of a zip gun? How is it made? At home. Okay. A zip gun, I'm actually disappointed, Aggies. You got. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I like this one. Okay, good. Well, well said. A zip gun is a gun that you can manufacture from parts you buy at a hardware store. So, for example, this gun was made with maybe $10 of parts you could buy at a store. There's a garden hose, a soldering iron, and a little spring. That's it. It's not that hard to make something to shoot a bullet. Um, you can find these on the internet if you know where to look. These look like keychain flashlights, but they're actually guns. All you need to fire a gun is to take a bullet and strike it hard enough. That's it. If you strike a bullet hard enough in the right spot, boom. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you a video now of these guys who made a, a, a gun in, the, in their garage. Okay. Do not try this at home. I know people often say this, but please do not try this at home. I am showing you this to illustrate how stupid these people are, but also how easy it is to make a firearm short of 3D printing. So what these guys did, geniuses with their cell phone flip cameras, right, um, is to make a rifle out of a piece of rubber tubing a metal pipe, and a single shotgun shell. These probably cost maybe 2 or $3 at Home Depot, right? You can go and buy them right now. So what they do, they use the tip of this pipe with this little dimple as a firing pin. And the idea is if you drop the shotgun shell into this rubber tube, ready for it, and you jam this pipe into the back of the shotgun shell, what's going to happen? Boom, right? You can see if you look closely, this little dimple on the back of the gun. That's where the charge is. There's actually gunpowder there. And if you strike it hard enough, you break the seal, you trigger the gunpowder, and it sends projectile forward. Now, does anyone, anyone want to see the problem with where they're about to fire this gun? Does anyone see the problem? Well, inside into the wall, it gets even worse than that. What else is, it, what else is present on this wall that's problematic? Wires! You see it, guys, right? See that electrical cable coming down like this? They're literally shooting at electrical wires. Do not try this at home. And you can see there's like three or four different holes in the box. They've done this before. Anyway, it gets worse. There's actually a fan <laughs> plugged into those wires. This guy's a moron. So what they're going to do is they're going to jam it and make it go kaboom, right? Ready? One, two, three, boom. And you can actually see the action. You can see the firing uh, pin explode. Um, and if you look carefully, another hole pops up on this box. Fortunately, they didn't strike this electrical wire four inches away from their shooting. Um, it's not that good. I don't think I could actually say that I can shoot this inch, not that inch. Maybe even at a couple feet. But this is stupid. They take the gun out, smoking, look how cool they are. Put it on YouTube, put it on mute, because they have some pretty awful language as well. But it seems par for the quest. That's why I don't show the video. The language is, is not worth a, a going to school. Now, these guys are idiots. Idiots, idiots, idiots. But did they break the law? Did they break any federal law? 
I'm not talking about California now because that's its own world. But in the other 49 states, did they break any law? The answer is probably not. Definitely no federal law. So our good friends at ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, our favorite convenience store, um, they've actually stated with some certainty your own gun is perfectly lawful. As long as you don't sell it into interstate commerce, and for those of you who think con law, you know what commerce means, this entire thing, but as long as you keep the gun for yourself, you are perfectly lawful. So this idiot in this garage took his pipe and his shotgun shell, and he made a gun, and he broke no law. Okay. So now, Josh, if, if you can make your own gun, why, is, why are the feds going after Cody, right? Why are, why are they hassling Cody? What, what, you know, what's their problem? Well, they don't really need a reason, but you know, why are they going after Cody in this case? Okay. They allege that Cody didn't make the gun, right? That's not their problem. The problem is not that he made the gun. The problem is that he put the files of how to make the gun on the internet. And the government explained that putting files on the internet is equivalent to exporting arms, right? In the same sense, if I put a AR-15 in a box and shipped it to Afghanistan, that the government sees is no different than putting a file on the internet. I see your quizzical faces, good. Um, for several reasons, I think this argument is severely flawed. Primarily the First and Second Amendments. So we start with the First Amendment, and we know under the Supreme Court's case law, the court has said over and over again, the government cannot, cannot impose a prior restraint on speech. What's a prior restraint on speech? They can't stop you from speaking. Now, if you say something bad, perhaps it can be punished after the fact for it. Maybe if it's libelous or something else, defamatory, fine. But they cannot punish you and stop you from speaking before. Uh, the most famous case is the Pentagon Papers case. This was a time when the New York Times wanted to publish uh, these secret papers they got about the war in Vietnam. And the government said, we have to stop them from publishing the newspaper. Can you imagine, right? We have to stop them from publishing a newspaper. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 no. They got this information, they can publish it. If you want to punch them after the fact, maybe you can do that, but you cannot stop a newspaper from running ahead. The government told Cody, you can't put these files on the internet. Take them down. So you may say, well, wait a minute, Josh, right? We're not talking about putting up you know, cat videos and you know, whatever, uh, Kim Kardashian memes, right? We're talking about putting dangerous stuff on the web, right? How to make a gun. So who here, maybe my friend in the back, who here is of the Anarchist Cookbook? Oh, I'm surprised your hand went up, right? Shocking. So what's the anarchist cookbook? <laughs> Mischief, I like that word. I usually call it my terrorism handbook. Uh, I think that's usually how you describe it. This book describes in, in, in very, very explicit detail how to blow stuff up, how to make bombs, how to make poison, how to make weapons, how to engage in kidnapping and terrorist activities. Basically, if you want to be a member of the Weather Underground in the 1960s, uh, this is what you would read. Maybe a couple of people don't know what I'm talking about. Um, this was your terrorist handbook to be a, a, you know, a, a radical in the 60s. Um, governments tried to ban this book. They tried to keep it off the shelves. Before those Amazon, there were actually bookstores. Uh, the Supreme Court and other courts said no. Merely because speech can be used to facilitate crime, that doesn't mean you can ban it. Right? Unless the person giving us has some specific intent to engage in the crime himself or to facilitate crime, you cannot ban a book. Wait a minute, Josh. This, this is a book. We're talking about you know, files and the internet with this code and all this other stuff. Well, look, information is speech. Um, the court has recognized a number of cases that there's no difference whether you have the spoken word, the printed word, or the coded word. If you choose to use a computer as your medium, you are still in your protections of the First Amendment. Uh, the court held that the creation and dissemination of information are speech. Both, look, you create the information, you make it, and you disseminate it, you share it. These are the twin attributes each protected by the First Amendment. And in truth, we live in a world that's increasingly governed by data. And the First Amendment ought to, I think, be read liberally to protect all of these manifests of speech in the electronic age. So I think on First Amendment grounds, Cody's pretty solid here. Now, what about the Second Amendment, right? 
The Second Amendment, which you shall have memorized by heart, states that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, what does that mean? In a 2008 case called District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, the Supreme Court recognized that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms, not connected to militia service. This was Dick Heller. Uh, he was a plaintiff in that case. Um, uh, perversely, Heller was actually a, uh, a security guard for the federal courts. So during the day, he had a gun, which he used to defend judges. But at night, when he went home, he had to give the gun back. So the judges, they can be defended. But, but poor Mr. Heller lives in a pretty rough neighborhood of D.C., had to go home by himself with no protection. And the Supreme Court said, no, you cannot do that to him. A couple years later, the Second Amendment got expanded. This is Otis McDonald, who lived in the, the other side of Chicago, the, the unsafe side. And he wanted a gun to protect himself. Chicago said, no, you cannot have one. The Supreme Court said, no. They invalidated Chicago's handgun ban. And they said that the Second Amendment protects the right to bear arms, not just for the federal government, but for the states. Um, this is a great picture uh, of, of Heller McDonald shaking hands. Um, Mr. McDonald died about a year or two ago. He was, he was a good guy. He, he, he was not the civil rights champion you'd expect to see, but he was a really good man. And uh, I got to meet him once when the case was argued. He's pretty cool. So, but this is the right to bear arms, right? So I'm going to do a little bit of improvising. And I'm going to argue that in order to have the right to bear arms, you need two basic rights. The first of which is the right to acquire arms. Now, why do you have the right to acquire arms? Imagine the government said, okay, fine. You guys can register a gun, but you can't buy one. Sure, you can register it, but, you know, if you moved here recently or you're, you're a kid or whatever, you got to turn 21, you can't buy one. The Second Amendment, at a minimum, provides some scrutiny for restrictions on purchasing arms. Now, I am not saying that anyone can buy a gun. Please don't misunderstand me. But at a minimum, the right to acquire arms is protected. So curiously, this was actually Dick Heller. And he had a gun in his house for the 1970s before D.C. banned them. He was required at all times to keep this trigger lock on his gun. If at any time he took this trigger lock off of his gun, he would be breaking the law. Even if, even if someone broke into his house and was about to assault him, lock off his gun, he would be breaking D.C. law. It, it's insane, but the, the lawyer for D.C. said this to the Supreme Court, and the chief justice was like, are you serious? Is, is that really your argument? There's no self-defense exception? No. But after Heller was decided, Mr. Heller was able to get this license. He did a little smiling photo. And with that, he was not able to acquire a firearm legally in the District of Columbia. So this is the right to acquire arms. The second subsidiary, to make arms. And this one, I think, is a lot stronger. Hey, please come in. There's some Chick-fil-A in the front as well. The right to make arms, I think, is a lot stronger. Long before we had Walmart and Cabela's and Dick's, people made their own guns, right? The idea of making, I'm sorry, buying a gun is a fairly recent innovation. Going back to the time of the American Revolution, militiamen, were responsible for basically making their own arms. Um, indeed, uh, uh, has anyone ever seen the miniseries John Adams on HBO? It's a good one. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. And there's this great scene where um, Abigail Adams, John Adams' wife, is making uh, musket balls out of lead. She's pouring, you can see, pouring lead into these molds to make um, uh, musket balls. Um, going back to the time of the American Revolution, there was a strong sense of making your own arms. And I firmly contend that far stronger than the right to buy arms is the right to make arms to suit your own needs, right? And this isn't only about trying to make plastic guns to evade the police. There are actually, I think, legitimate reasons why you'd want a custom-made gun. So imagine you don't have an index finger, right? You had an accident, your hand was amputated, and you don't have an index finger. How can you exercise the right to bear arms? I don't know. Tie it to your arm. Give a foot pedal, right? There are different ways of manufacturing guns to accommodate disabilities, which actually I think makes sense for having mechanisms, right? The mere fact that you're disabled should not mean you can't buy a gun, even if the um, uh, uh, the manufacturer of the of the uh, product isn't willing to accommodate that. So I'm willing to contend that the Second Amendment embraces both a right to uh, uh, acquire arms and a right to make arms. But wait, my friends, as I say, there's more. We're talking here about not just one constitutional right, but two constitutional rights working in tandem. 
So to give an example that's often in the media, what if I were to say there's a new law that says you cannot wish someone a Merry Christmas? Illegal. You know, the so-called Merry Christmas becomes real, right? You cannot wish someone a Merry Christmas. Is that violating your free speech? Or is it violating your free exercise? Or is it violating both? Uh, the court in a case called Employment Division v. Smith recognized that when one right reinforces another, so-called constitutional hybrid, it's actually stronger protection. So here, what are we talking about? You're talking about how to make guns. The speech that Cody put on the internet was how to manufacture guns. This is core, talking about the Second Amendment, right? This is very, very heightened protection where you're censoring someone talking about the other constitutional right. This, I think, warrants um, high levels of scrutiny. So what laws exist today concerning 3D printed guns? The first law is known as the Undetectable Firearms Act. This was passed in 1988, and what it basically says is that any gun must have a certain quantity of metal sufficient to trigger a magnetometer, you know, the, the, the x-ray machine at the airport, right? So every gun must have a certain amount of metal in it that can set off an airplane, uh, a, a, a metal detector at the airport. Why is this law on the books? It's because of the Glock handguns. Everyone know what the Glock handgun is? Yeah, okay. But more so than the Glock handgun, this is Bruce Willis's fault. Okay, why is this Bruce Willis's fault? In the movie Die Hard, Everyone see Die Hard, the best Christmas movie ever, right? In the movie Die Hard, John McClane, played by Bruce Willis's character, has this one line, and I'm going to read a few. I don't have nearly as much bravado as he does, but I'll do my best. He says, luggage, that punk pulled a Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up on your airport x-ray machines here, and it costs more than you make in a month. Everything he said was wrong. <laughs> Every single part of that sentence was wrong. So... There is no Glock 7, no such gun exists. It's not made of porcelain, it's made out of metal and composite plastics. It's not made in Germany, it's made in Austria. It will show up in an x-ray machine, and they're actually fairly affordable. So everything he said was wrong. But this sufficiently freaked out Congress, and they're very easily skittered, uh, uh, to pass this undetectable firearms act. But little did they know uh, almost 30 years ago that this law would serve a new purpose with this advent of 3D printed plastic guns. Um, so a couple years ago, there was a movement by a few senators to try to um, uh, uh, amend and expand this act such that any gun with any amount of plastic will be uh, uh, illegally. Um, that law didn't pass. Um, so we're still stuck here with the law from 1988. Now, there are various other proposals of trying to handle the situation. So uh, my, my favorite senator from New York, Senator Schumer, who loves talking from posters of things he wants to ban, uh, a press conference where he explained that he wants to get rid of these guns, it, but his bill did not go very far. Proposals, uh, let's ban plastic, right? Let's ban the plastic using these guns. That way we're going to have uh, control. Um, even if you were to ban the plastic, it would not get you very far. Why? You can 3D print metal. Yes, like in the Terminator, right? This is a 1911 handgun printed entirely from a 3D printer. See, it's a solid concept that Austin, Texas. That's a, that's a lab in Austin. I visited there about a year or two ago. And they made a solid steel 1911 handgun entirely out of a 3D printer. And it, it feels good. as the right weight, right balance, fire. It also costs $40,000, so it's not a very effective use of money. You can buy the same gun for a few hundred bucks in the black market, uh, uh, so there's no reason why any criminal would, 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 would print this, um, but, but it is feasible to make these sorts of guns. Uh, another proposal is to regulate gunpowder, uh, saying that we don't want to sell people gunpowder because they'll make these 3D guns. Um, that argument is a non sequitur. Now an argument sued especially for this institution, which has a very robust IP program. I think one of the ways which this technology may be inhibited is not through gun control, but through intellectual property control. What do I mean by that? You all know what DRM is, digital rights management. So whenever you buy a song from maybe iTunes or maybe you buy a book on Amazon Kindle, you're not actually buying the song. You're only obtaining a license to it, and it's locked down, right? So if I buy a book on my Amazon Kindle, 
I can't open up on my Barnes & Noble Nook or some other reader. So you have these restrictions on the sorts of things you buy. Um, why do we have this? Well, because in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, the music industry said, if we don't have these protections, we're going to kill the industry. Uh, and now we're having as well with books. But the real threat of intellectual property in the future involves 3D printing. Okay, why? Well, it's one thing to download the latest Taylor Swift song or to download a movie or to or download some new uh, uh, you know, music video or whatever else. It's a very different thing to use 3D printing in order to make stuff. And I'm putting aside for a moment guns, right? We'll put guns aside for the moment. What are some of the things that people would want to 3D print that's very expensive and cheap to make? Clothes. Sneakers. So imagine the newest, you know, LeBron James sneakers, right? Cost what, $200, maybe more? The parts cost what, maybe a few bucks? It made in some sweatshop in some third world country? What if instead of spending $250 on a pair of LeBron James sneakers, you can print it in your garage for 20 bucks? Whoa. That's where Nike loses their business. So we're not just talking about downloading a Taylor Swift song or downloading the newest you know, Will Ferrell movie or whatever, right? You're making stuff. And manufacturers are legitimately concerned about the prospect of 3D printing if it gets to the point where it's cheap enough to make stuff and you don't need to go to Foot Locker and buy a new pair of $200 sneakers. So this is where I think a economic principle can come into play. The Bootleggers and Baptists. Anyone know what this is? Ever hear about the bootlegger and Baptists? Professors don't raise their hands. Anyone else? So during Prohibition, right, there are two groups that want to support Prohibition. The first, you have the Baptists, right? The Baptists have the religious beliefs, think that evil, I'm sorry, alcohol is evil, and we need to get rid of it. But who else loves Prohibition? The bootlegger, right? Why do bootleggers love prohibition? Because they make even more money. They can charge higher rates for prohibited alcohol. Um, are any of you from dry counties? Okay. At the border of your county, is there a liquor store on the other side of the border? Why is there a liquor store right on the border of the other side of the county? Jack up the rates. Now, what you probably don't know is the reason why your county is still dry is because of that liquor store. That liquor store lobbies fiercely to keep this county dry. That way they have a monopoly on the sale of alcohol in that region. <clears throat> the same principles apply. Okay? What you're going to have, I think, are manufacturers afraid of 3D printing. And you're also going to have people who want to get rid of guns. And they're going to work together in a Baptist and Bootlegger coalition such that you have Kanye West, this is an actual verbatim quote, screaming, saying, I'm afraid of 3D printing because the internet destroyed the music industry. Now that's what textiles are afraid of. He's right. I mean, for once, he's actually right here. Um, so he'll be up there screaming at textiles, but then people actually want to regulate guns can use this as a way. How would this work? Has anyone ever tried to make a copy of a US currency on a really high quality copy machine? You're good human beings. It, no, no one's ever tried it. If you take a $100 bill, put it on a copy machine, like a, you know, a really good one, a good color copier, know what it's going to do? Spit out an error message saying no. So Canon and Xerox and HP, they work with Treasury. And the Treasury Department says, you're not allowed to do this. You put a filter into the machine to limit what you can spit out. You probably don't even know this. It's true. It won't, it won't actually work. There are filters built in to prohibit you from making copies of currency. What if a similar filter was installed on 3D printers? That if you tried to print a gun or something similar to a gun, it would give you an error message saying, no, nah, no, nah, you can't do that. We're not going to let you. So here, whether you have it through government regulations or even the voluntary cooperation of 3D manufacturers to put these filters into your device that says, we won't let you print certain objects. This, I think, is probably one of the paths that we use to regulate 3D printing uh, going forward. Um, they tried this indirectly. For one of the companies that makes 3D printers refused to sell Cody a device. They refused to sell them once, and we don't want you making guns. So what did he do? Get someone else buy it for them. So not very effective to get around this. At the present moment, and this is the subject of the litigation I mentioned earlier, export control laws are the primary mechanism being used to censor these sorts of items. 
and specifically something called the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, ITAR. Um, ITAR is based on a Cold War era statute that didn't let people ship weapons abroad. So the idea was, we're at war with the Soviet Union, do not send stinger missiles to Afghanistan. Right? That law makes sense, right? It, it seems like a fairly reasonable reaction to people shipping arms to the Soviet Union and the Mujahideen in, in Afghanistan. But today, this law has been interpreted to apply not only to physical weapons or, or perhaps uh, technical data about them, excuse me, but even speech. If I want to create a book about cryptography, and that book has a CD-ROM, those, those existed at one point, but there were these round things that contain information, right? If I want to put a CD-ROM in my book with some inform information about cryptography, I need the government's permission, and they may not let me do it. Why? Well, cryptography can be dangerous, and people can use it for ill. That brings us to the facts of this case. In May of 2013, the U.S. State Department sent a letter to Cody in Austin. He was still, uh, I think he dropped out by that point, but it was pretty close. Uh, uh, he was then a law student at UT Austin. And he said, hey, Mr. Wilson, we've become aware that you are engaged in exporting of arms. Cody was like, what? Putting files on the internet is, in a government's view, the same thing as sending guns abroad to Afghanistan. And they actually sent a list of 10 files that you put on the internet. The Defense Distributed Liberated Pistol, uh, the Dirty Diane that I mentioned before, and a few other items. And they said, hey, Mr. Wilson, the data should be removed from public access immediately. The government sent a letter to code him and saying that the files you put on the internet need to be taken down immediately. Now, I'll, get to, I'll do a Q&A in a few minutes, okay? I promise. He did. He, he complied with the order, and he removed all the files. And then he requested permission to post them, which is what this letter says. Uh, the government, unsurprisingly, sat on that request for nearly two years, and they only replied after we sued him. <laughs> we filed suit in May of 2015, so about a year ago now, challenging that these actions violated Cody's First and Second Amendment rights. Um, the district court ruled against us. Uh, we lost. We, had a, we filed suit in Austin. Uh, the case was argued for the Fifth Circuit in uh, June, so about two or three months ago. We are patiently waiting on a decision. Uh, I will maintain that these actions are unlawful, uh, both under the Constitution and for a lot of statutory arguments that you don't care about. You don't like statutes, right? But it's, it's also contrary to law. Uh, but this issue, regardless of what happens to Cody's case, is not going away. Uh, the power and potential of making items with 3D printed guns um, uh, uh, will be difficult to regulate under these sorts of Cold War era statutes. And a different approach would be necessary, if at all, of how to tackle this. Now, my esteemed colleague uh, has entered the room, and I will kindly turn it over to him, and then we will take any questions from you uh, for the remainder of the class. Thank you all so much. I'll sit down here. Mm -hmm. All right. That way you can be closer when you want to jump up. I'm in the pouncing position right here. Got some encryption on this computer. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Glenn Lunny. Uh, those of you who have not had me before may not know, but I teach primarily in the intellectual property area. I have an engineering degree from A and M, law degree from Stanford, and PhD in economics. You know, because you get bored when you hit forty, you got to find something to do in economics. So, uh, primarily an intellectual property lawyer, not really a con law guy, certainly not a Second Amendment guy. Um, and I didn't get to hear your whole talk, and I apologize for that. We had something else going on, so it just had to slip over. But I'm going to try and address uh, what I see as sort of the basic argument you're making in the paper and the problem spots that I see. So um, when we think about constitutional law today, where we are now is a function of where we were, sort of historical path dependence. So it's primarily a function of the so-called Lochner era and the Lochner court. So Lochner versus New York was itself a 1905 decision of the Supreme Court striking down New York laws, uh, regulating the maximum number of hours bakery employees could work in a week. 
And so the court struck it down, and we would call that decision today sort of Lochnerism, an improper interposition of the judiciary's views on what the right or just laws for society are, uh, replacing the views of uh, democratically elected legislature with the views of appointed justices in that particular case. And of course, the Lochner era was not just this one decision in 1905, ran from the late 19th century, 18, mid 1890s, up until the Great Depression. And during this time, we had Justice Holmes, Justice Brandeis, uh, two of the members of the Lochner court that was systematically dissent from what the court was saying, and they would make points such as, we're the court, we're fairly insulated, we're appointed, we're not elected, we can't really second guess the legislature, and we should defer to them on what the right answers to these social ills are. Now, their perspectives on these things were in dissent for most of this period, and it's not really until the Great Depression in the 1930s and the federal government and the state government's various efforts to ameliorate the conditions of the Great Depression that the rest of the court finally goes along. And there's some suggestion that Roosevelt's threat to amend um, the rules about the court so you could appoint additional justices if certain justices were over the age, I think it was 75. Um, the court packing plan may have played some roles in the court's view. Uh, but since that time, uh, constitutional law in the United States has been dominated by the rejection of Lochner. We don't want courts sitting in scrutiny as sort of second guessers of the legislature as to whether rent control or uh, hourly working regulations are appropriate or inappropriate. And so what happened after Lochner was rejected in the 40s, 50s, and 60s is we got a few isolated areas of express constitutional provisions, such as the First Amendment's guarantee on free speech, and the game became, uh, can you fit within the express protection of a given amendment so that you get strict scrutiny? Now, we have a standard for strict scrutiny, no least restrictive alternatives, fundamental government purpose, necessary to achieve it. But the truth about it is that the standard's basically irrelevant. If you're in the strict scrutiny bailiwick, you're going to be unconstitutional. Whatever the legislature has done, if it crosses over into an area where strict scrutiny is going to be appropriate, pretty much guaranteed the law is going to be struck down. Indeed, at the Supreme Court level, since the 1940s, uh, only been one government action that was not struck down and that was the Japanese internment during World War II and it was not quite clear they applied strict scrutiny but they ought to have and so that was upheld probably wrongly but um, it, sort of the one example. So you either are in a prohibited area where the government may not act scrutiny and so you strike down whatever the government does or you're in rational basis scrutiny where the court pretends to look at what the legislature did and talks about is there a rational relation to a legitimate government purpose, but the truth is that the legislature can do whatever it wants, and if you or I or anyone else is unhappy, we have no remedy in the courts. Our only remedy is the ballot box. And so I think what um, Professor Blackman's trying to do here in his paper is he's playing the game, right? He's trying to get restrictions or government regulations on 3D printed guns into the strict scrutiny sphere, because once you get it into the strict scrutiny sphere, uh, you're going to strike it down. Uh, and so he pretty much concedes right off that maybe a ban under the Second Amendment of all 3D printed guns might get you into that sphere and strike down government regulation. Uh, but if the statute regulates 3D printing of guns, just as it currently we have statutes regulating regular guns, however they're made, uh, then that would be permissible as long as it's reasonable. And, of course, that word reasonable can c cover a multitude of sins. Um, and so he's going to look at the First Amendment as sort of a plus factor, and either on its own or together with the Second Amendment and the hybrid approach will manage to get over the line and get these regulations into strict scrutiny where they will be struck down. Um, but I think his First Amendment analysis is a little too superficial and not entirely persuasive. Uh, it's not one that I haven't seen before because I've seen the exact same arguments raised in the intellectual property context. So in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which he discusses in one particular context, 
one of the things that provision did is that it restricts the trafficking in decryption technology. So you guys don't remember the 80s very well, but we've got a series of, as everything migrated from analog to digital, uh, the problem became how do you prevent people from copying your software, your movie, your music? And so the first solution they went with was copyright. You tried to sue people and that didn't work out too well. You didn't sue actual consumers yet, you just sued competing manufacturers. And what they did to prevent consumer copying was they included various forms of technical protection measures, TPM. Uh, and these technical protection measures were various forms of encryption. And so unless you had the key, often at the time you had to insert your CD-ROM, or back then the five and a quarter floppy, of the original program before it would run, because it would check to make sure you had bought a copy. Um, and of course what happened is people created decryption keys, that is they created small programs that when you loaded them on the computer would allow an unauthorized copy of Lotus 1, 2, 3, or whatever it is you wanted to work with or play with uh, to run on your computer. And we got this cycle of ever increasing encryption followed by ever increasing decryption. So whenever you, people would create a technical digital lock, people would create the key. Eventually Congress stepped in in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act 1998 and said, a trafficking in, we know it's a bad thing because it's trafficking in, right? That's how we know it's bad. Got to stop it. Uh, trafficking in these digital keys is unlawful. And so there was a lawsuit. Uh, and so uh, your DVDs that your movies came on in the 90s were encrypted with a program called CSS, Content Scrambling System, uh, which was very basic, very simple encryption system. It was sort of like um, Pig Latin as a new language as far as encryption goes. And so someone wrote a sort of 45 line program called D, D E C S S. And it decrypted your CSS. So when you bought the DVD, you could watch it on any computer, right? It would only run on certain devices. If you had a Linux, for example, base machine, it would not run on that. So the DC S it on that. Geographic territory, you bought it in Canada, you wanted to play it in Minnesota, you couldn't, uh, and so DCSS would allow you to do that as well. So they were sued by Universal and various others. Uh, it was originally Remerdes, but he settled after the district court, and it was Corley at the Second Circuit. And his argument was, well, this is code, it's expression. Uh, it not only does the decryption, but it's a communicative act. And so it ought to receive First Amendment. Again, the argument is, well, if you get over there into strict scrutiny, we're golden because the court's going to strike it down. Um, but the court rejected the argument that just because it was code uh, and expressive in some sense, that meant it was entitled to strict scrutiny. Uh, it clearly had a functional role to play as well. It actually did the encryption. And the court rejected the analogy, it's just like a book or a diagram explaining how to do something, because it not only explained how to do it, it did it, right? You put it in your computer and it decrypted the CSS lock on your DVD and you could watch the movie or make copies of the movie anywhere you wanted. And so because the code was functional and not just expressive, and indeed the expressive aspect of code is almost functional. I have friends who are computer programmers. We do not sit around reading source code just for amusement's sake. We don't write haiku in Fortran or C++, right? This is not what we use our software for. We write software to do things, to accomplish tasks. That's what this was written for. And of course, you know, they tried to show that it really was uh, expressive. The haiku example was not entirely made up on my part, right? They sold t-shirts with the C DCSS program written out as a form of haiku. Um, so that you could wear it as a sort of expressive, but I mean the truth is it's not really expressive uh, in any meaningful ordinary sense of the word in its typical or everyday use. And so the court applied intermediate scrutiny uh, and eventually upheld the DMCA against the constitutional challenge and so they were, the government was allowed to control or a private individual through a civil liability suit was entitled to, to use the power of the government to control sale and distribution and creation of the DCSS code. Now, of course, that's the legal result. Did it matter? Right? If you want a copy of DCSS today, you would want to because DVDs are not really the way things are transmitted. Can you still get it? 
of course you can't, right? And so often the real problem with the digital rules uh, are not that we don't have them or that they're not constitutional, it's just that they're practically not enforceable. And so I think you got a little trouble there in terms of just saying it's expressive and therefore strict scrutiny. I don't think the courts are going to go that way given the functional role these files play. This is not just a book about how to make a gun. This is a computer program that when you put it in a certain machine makes a gun itself. And so I think you have to acknowledge that functional role a little more directly. And I would push a little further on that, right? If you're really staying strict scrutiny and therefore it's, it's not going to survive constitutional examination, does that mean that a file that's going to 3D print an automatic weapon is therefore lawful because it's a form of free speech, right? It's expressive. It's just as expressive as the Liberator gun which is permissible under existing gun control regulations. So I'm not really sure you add much to your Second Amendment argument by bringing in the First Amendment. I just don't think it's going to play that way. So if it's legitimate to restrict CAD files for 3D printing automatic weapons under the Second Amendment, I think it's still going to be permissible. Um, there were a couple of things I, I didn't like, and I'll just mention those in passing since we're running out of time. Uh, false premises or maybe fallacies. So in the bootlegger and the Baptist, you're not, you're not dealing with the bootlegger, right? In your example, it's not the bootlegger, the person who's making unauthorized copies that's seeking to have their behavior prohibited. It's the person who's the manufacturer of the legitimate technology. It's Nike who's making the, gun, uh, the shoes, right? The LeBron James shoes. It's not the person who's counterfeiting the LeBron James shoes who doesn't want competition from uh, the 3D printing. So it's not really the bootlegger that's stepping into the role, it's the legitimate manufacturer. So it'd be Nike plus the Baptist. So you may want to rethink how you phrase that. It, so it's not the smuggler of the alcohol in any event. Um, and, and then I also didn't like how you say, well, it's much easier to make guns some other way if you want to make an undetectable homemade gun. There's much easier ways to do it than to 3D print it the very expensive Colt 1911 model that they made using the 3D printing of metal. But I think for this to matter, either to the Second Amendment or generally politically, we have to imagine a world 10 or 15 years or maybe 20 years from now where 3D printing is vastly easier as a way of making these homemade guns. And only when we get to that world does it really matter, either from the Second Amendment right perspective uh, that people should be able to make their guns at home in this way, as well as the need for government regulation of the activity. So I'm going to stop with that. Uh, and we'll better one, don't we? Uh, yeah, I think maybe a few minutes after. Okay. okay, but there's a class. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll reply briefly and then go right to Q&A. Um, uh, the Corley case, which you cited about the functional versus expressive, we have a fairly extensive discussion on that. The CAD files are actually quite expressive. They design a structure in three dimensions. Um, this is not executable functional code, um, so this is not the case we're talking about uh, functional speech. Um, in terms of the, uh, 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 the entire scrutiny bucket, um, I, I don't think I talk about strict scrutiny um, too much except to say that when you're dealing with expressive speech, you do apply rigorous review. Um, one note, and I love uh, tweaking column people, there was actually a second case where the court upheld a racial classification in the 20th century. Know what it was? Gruder. Yeah, so the affirmative action cases were also upholding racial classifications under strict scrutiny, but though it wasn't really uh, a strict scrutiny. Um, I don't have anything much more to say about that. I'm more interested in your questions. We have to leave fairly shortly. Um, so I, in the back, you were waiting patiently. Yes, sir. Of course, with the Barbara Streisand effect. You want to tell us? Go for it. Yeah, the second the second the government tried banning people downloaded in mass, and this is this, the DCSS example that, that he mentioned. Once you regulate something, it goes away. Um, and perhaps I'll clarify the Baptist and the bootlegger uh, analogy. Um, it's not only concerning people making good, as the people with good motivations and bad motivations, right? So during prohibitions, who had the good motivations? The Baptists, right? They were acting to protect their rights. Who had perhaps the, the bad motivations? They were the some of their agenda. Coalition here would be 
people trying to protect their IP rights and gun controllers who use this as a leverage to advance their agenda. It's not about bootlegging, manufacturing, whatever else. It's that people with various motivations support the same piece of legislation. So I think here when you actually regulate something and you try and ban it, it makes it much more prevalent. Yes, sir. This isn't really about him Not printing. The printing was fine. Under federal law, printing your gun is perfectly lawful. Well, it, it does. It does. And I'll probably address another point Mr. Lenny made. Um, the Second Amendment actually bolsters a claim in this respect. The gun put online was a handgun, the quintessential weapon under Heller, right? The quintessential weapon. He is trying to speak about the core protection of the Second Amendment. We explain in our briefs very clearly that the Second Amendment does not protect automatic weapons. So it would actually not help him at all in this case. But the fact is, you were dealing with speech about a handgun, which is at the core of the Second Amendment. In that sense, it protects. Okay, but the Second Amendment doesn't protect your right to speak about the Second Amendment. Well, that's where the First Amendment comes in. Right. But so but that's what you just said, though, is the Second Amendment. This is about Second Amendment. So you didn't say anything about him actually using the bill or printing the gun. So I don't understand how this is about the Second Amendment. You know, you're speaking about the manuscript. So let me give you another example, right? Let's say the government passed a law saying you can't print any books by making a printing press. You're not actually making a newspaper, but you've now regulated books by making a printing press. Freedom of the press, right? It's in the Constitution. Rights reinforce each other in that respect. That when you say you can't talk about making guns, how is someone supposed to make it? Right? How is someone supposed to exercise their right if they can't learn about making in the first place? Make sense? Sir, you hear what's up also? I was just going to say, couldn't you make an argument that if you have a right to militia, you have a right to disseminate information that could actually harm that militia? Um, I mean, my reading of the Second Amendment is not countenance on the militia clause, um, but I think the general idea of sharing information with your fellow citizens is perfectly reasonable. Yeah? Yes, sir. is that this would enable people who are, using Justice Scalia's own words, were not overturning standing historical Dwarf sentences in Heller would completely undermine Second Amendment rights in Heller. The concern from the government's perspective is that people who are not allowed to have guns now have the program need to be printed. So it weakens the First Amendment rights because the government's rights much higher because well, uh, that's true, but even under federal law, even if you're a felon, you can make your own guns. You can't possess it. You can make your, no, but for personal use, yeah, you can. The zip gun you made, you can, you can make. You can't acquire one. So it's actually this weird wrinkle, right? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, no, no, but uh, under, the, no, I, I understand that. I understand. clearly intended to say it is a federal crime to be a felon in Right, it's where you get it from. Right, so the, the issue here, though, and I, 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 you, you, I discussed this earlier in the presentation, but ATF rules don't prevent you from making a gun. Commerce to the federal government of jurisdiction. Yes, sir. The liberator detective. Yes, yeah. So, so this, this is part of the issue. Part of the design of the liberator is to include a block of metal that will be sufficient to trigger it. Your follow-up question is, can you remove that block? Ah, I knew it. Um, uh, yes, it can be removed, but that's not the design of the gun. And if you possess that gun without the record, then you are breaking the Undetectable Firearms Act. So facilitating the production of the weapon is undetectable. Well, the weapon as designed is not undetectable. It becomes undetectable when you deviate from the design. Look, if you sell a, a shotgun, you go to the local hardware store or a local gun store, you buy a shotgun, right? And then you saw off the barrel. You've taken a lawful gun and you've made it unlawful. There are lots of examples of having equipment that are otherwise lawful that when you do something that they become unlawful. Isn't there a difference between the risk of a sawed off shotgun and the risk of an undetectable weapon? Uh, is there like a distinct difference there? That would what's, just, what's the difference? A uh, sawed off shotgun. Well, I showed you, for example, that rubber shotgun too, right? It's a piece of rubber. It wouldn't detect either. You can use plastic just as well. A plastic tube would work just as well. The, the is, there's lots of mischief, to use a word that was thrown out earlier, right? 
There's lots of mischief here. And what the government cannot do is punish the mere speech. There are lots of books that describe how to create these various products. There are lots of lessons that describe this. If the government wants to prohibit a sawed-off shotgun, which they've done for several decades, or if they want to prohibit a gun that um, is undetectable, I think there's a reasonable interest there. What they can't do is punish the mere speech of sharing of how to make it. Yeah? Is the metal that's going to be put in the refrigerator, is it going to be necessary for the functionality? No, it's not. It's not. It, it, the reason why the, the metal's there is to comply with the Tecla Firearms Act. That, that, that's, why, that's why the metal's there. I'm sorry to have to end this now, but I want to be respectful to school's time. So thank you all for being here and grab a sandwich on your way out or some water and please sign the rule if you have it. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you.